Hey everybody, just a quick reminder, this is a great month to sign up for the Producers Perspective Pro because it's free all month and tomorrow, Tuesday, we have our first offline networking event. You get to mingle with all the other pros and me and a whole bunch of other special guests. Sign up today, come mingle with us tomorrow and get the whole month for free. And now on to the podcast. I want to be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. I want to be Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Producers Perspective podcast. So we've done over 80 of these podcasts since we began in January of 2015. We've had Tony Award winning directors, Pulitzer Prize winning writers. We've even had the chief drama critic for the New York Times. But there's one group that has been seriously underrepresented here on the podcast, and that is the actor. (laughs) So it's time to give some attention to the folks in front of the footlights and what an actor we have today. Welcome to the podcast, Broadway's own Stephen Pasquale. Welcome, Stephen. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. So Stephen is one of the most in-demand leading men on Broadway. He sang the crap out of the lead in Bridges in Madison County. Uh, Just finished up an acclaimed run of Robert Bridegroom off-Broadway where he won a Lucille Lortel Award for Best Actor in a Musical. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Uh, Also seen in the concert version of Wild Party last year, which was one of my favorite theatrical events of the last 12 months. Also Reasons to be Pretty, A Man of No Importance, a host of others. Took a little break from Broadway and broke a lot of Broadway casting directors' hearts when he went to Hollywood where he starred in the seven seasons of Rescue Me. Done a host of TV and film. Stephen, when did you get bit by the acting bug? Where did this begin for all of you? Uh, I was a late <clears throat> bloomer. I, I sort of caught the bug, I would say, junior year in high school. Uh, I got hurt in a playing football and had to sort of sit out for quite a while. And I did the fall play, which was Fame, the musical. Uh, what a rendition that high school production of Fame, the musical was. Who were you? I played Tyrone, the black kid dancing his way to the top of the Big Apple. It was the worst thing you've ever seen. Not zero percent of anyone who saw that would think this person has a chance of being a professional actor. Is there videotape? There is videotape, but Can it's like it uh, yeah, it's like it requires like a ton of whiskey and like dares, uh, and you know it's it's not it's not something I'm I'm willing to share uh, really ever. Uh, but it's pretty it's pretty priceless if you get a look. And then that summer I went away to the Cherub program at Northwestern, which is like a very uh, competitive summer training program for kids who are going into their senior year in high school. And that's when I really sort of was around a bunch of other kids who loved it and were good at it. And uh, I would say caught the bug for sure that summer between, between junior and senior year in high school. And then did you just decide, that's it, I'm dedicating my life to this, forget football, forget sports, I'm going to go to yeah. college for this? Yeah, I, mean, I was never a good enough athlete to make of my life out of it, but I thought it would pay for college. Uh, but I really, I really fell in love with uh, acting in the theater community. Um, so yeah, once I once the once the bug bit me, I found myself really one track mind uh, at that point going forward. Where did you go to school? I went briefly to Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas, for a semester, uh, and then I found Dallas to be challenging. So I uh, transferred. I was in the process of transferring to Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. And I went to New York on a whim, and, and I had an audition for a national touring company of West Side Story. Um, and I booked it. I booked the Tony Understudy and the little-known jet, non-dancing jet named Guitar, spelled G-E-E-T-A-R. And I went out on the road with West Side Story for about a year. So where where did you train? Where did, Were you just a natural, gifted actor, singer? Yeah, I... I, I I'm a good mimic, so I would sing along in the car to Billy Joel and uh, Donny Hathaway and Stevie Wonder and eventually Mandy Patinkin and then Anthony Warlow, who for me is pound for pound the greatest legit singer in the world. Uh, and that's really how I learned to sing, was was mimicking those guys. And so, uh, you know, if it ain't broke. And when you, so you went on the road for a while and then you got back mm-hmm. here to New York? I went on the road with West Side Story for about a year and then a couple of us came in on a Monday when we were in like Wilmington, Delaware or some cultural hub and we came in for an audition, uh, for a bunch of auditions that day and I auditioned to play Chris and Miss Saigon uh, and I booked uh, the job. So I went out on the road with Miss Saigon for almost three years. I played Miss Saigon almost 1,200 times. Why, God, yeah. why? Yeah, super challenging, amazing. I saw 50... American cities I learned how to maintain a performance I learned how to not go crazy after doing the same show for six months 
you know, it was a completely formative experience. So let's talk about that for a second. Yeah. How you not go crazy doing the same role in the same show? Because a lot of people think, oh, acting is so on oh, Broadway, so exciting, but it's an assembly line performance. It, it is so hard. It is it is the hardest thing about being a Broadway actor. Now I work mostly uh, in in my in my life as an artist off Broadway, where you where I feel like the the best work is being done. But your contract is four four months, three months, five. months months so by the end of that you feel uh like you really haven't hit that that moment that you hit in a long run whether you're on tour or on broadway where for me is about six months in where you're like wow how am i going to do this every day the repetition of of movement and motion is so challenging it makes your brain kind of feel a little bit crazy it's the hardest thing i would say without question about a long run is maintaining the performance without feeling a little bit like within the performance like you're going crazy it's interesting. William Goldman talks about it a lot in the season, how especially in a comedy, like it's hard for a director to come back after four or five months when he's directed a comedy because the only way to keep yourself from going crazy is to change things up a little bit. And then the director ends up coming back and being like having to pull everybody back or push them one way or the other because the idea of maintaining something uh, and honoring what you built in rehearsal but being free enough that you don't go crazy is the is the balance that's really hard. And I... Now that I think about it, it's even harder for a musical. With a play, you're doing reasons to be yeah. pretty, and someone can go a little off rhythm yeah. or do something different, and it spices it up. But a musical is to rhythm, to beat, yeah. to note. I mean, there's a literal, actual metronome that you honor when you do a musical. It's really hard. I don't think it's. Uh, I don't even think there's a way to properly articulate it. But people who can do long runs successfully are really high skill actors and have an have an amazing um, fortitude in their in their brains. Any specific things you do when you're doing it to keep it fresh? You know, I try to. Uh, I try to. I'm. I'm. A, I'm a person that. That. I feel like there's two schools of acting, or three schools of acting. There's like the sort of robot school, which is like you build this thing and then you honor it exactly every night, good or bad, and you literally just try to always recreate the exact thing you built. And then there's um, sort of going crazy and trying to change it up so much that it always feels fresh and uh, new. Uh, which is also, I think, challenging because you don't. It, if you if you subscribe to that school, you you can really throw the other people you're working with. So I find for me, somewhere in the middle is a is a great is a happy medium where you're honoring what you built in rehearsal, but feeling free enough to, you know, occasionally build in a new moment or, you know, uh, change some timing up. Uh, you know, as long as it feels copacetic within the company. So you're collecting all this per diem all over the country. Oh my God. Back in the 19 days. years old and one of the last great tours. I mean, like, I think we made 850 bucks a week per diem. And you were sitting down places, Sit too. down tours. They, they would ship our car from city to city. We had, like, nice hotels. I mean, it was, like, it was good living. Of course, the issue, my issue was I moved to New York with all this money in the bank thinking, well, I've had two auditions. I got two jobs. This will be easy. And I got to New York and didn't book a job for a year and a half. Spent every tour dollar I saved. Uh, didn't buy an apartment, didn't do any investing, just foolish young artists, lesson learned. I could have invested in a Broadway show, Ken. You could have invested in, in those days, like yeah. Aspects of Love or something. Yeah, exactly. You didn't do it in New York? I never did it in New York, Peter Lawrence, even though I was here and totally unemployed and like running out of money. I just did Peter Lawrence. Did you? Podcast. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Uh, so what was the first job you booked here in New York after that year and a half drought? Well, I had this amazing sort of humbling thing. You know, when you come to New York, people don't know you. So you have to sort of like get people have to get to know you a little bit. <clears throat> so I was getting close to a lot of things and people thought like, oh, he's really great. But like, who is he? He's like been on the road for four years. Uh, and so I booked my first job, which was to stand by for Brian Darcy James in the off Broadway Wild Party. Andrew Lippa's Wild Party. Almost 15 months after I moved to New York, 16 months. So at that point, I was like, oh, my gosh, okay, I'm finally a working actor. Now I had come from making all this tour money with per diem and high salary, and then I get to New York where this really amazing musical is happening off Broadway, and I'm realizing, wow, i got to live on 500 bucks a week. This is different. New York is different. It's like a new game. So you said no one knew you. Do you find that actors have to market themselves other than just doing what you do? No, I think if you're good at it and you're in New York, you're going to be okay. But I do oftentimes have conversations with young actors who say, I got this job on tour, should I take it or not? And I always say, look, a tour is where you go to make money and save money. 
but nobody in New York is going to go and see you in it. So it's about, do you want to be here and sort of in the grind and getting, letting people get to know you? Uh, but you're broke, but maybe it'll work out for you because you'll book a great job. Or do you want to go on a tour and save some money, pro- you know, give yourself a little freedom economically? It's always about freedom versus security, right, artistically, in my mind. And so, uh, you know, that's the advice I give young actors often. Okay, so when does Rescue Me come into the equation here? You're banging around on the boards a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I, I did a couple of, uh, what did I do? I did, I did, I understood I understudied Brian Darcy James, and then a great thing happened to me. Dan Sullivan cast me in Spinning into Butter, which is this wonderful Rebecca Gilman play at Lincoln Center. Really high quality, great people, and it took me out of the casting pool of just people who are thought of as singers. And so I, people started to think of me as an actor, and I don't think realized I sang. And so I spent uh, many years, really, before I worked my way back into doing musicals, like you know, on, on a on a regular basis. Um, so I did a play. I did that play. I did a tiny part in a movie called Vanilla Sky that I got cut out of. Uh, I realized at the premiere. I uh, I did my first on camera job ever was Six Feet Under. I played a I played Michael C Hall's love interest in season one of Six Feet Under. Um, I just kicked around. I went to Sundance and I worked on very early productions of The Light in the Piazza, which is how Adam Gettle came into my life, and we've had sort of a long standing creative love affair for many years. Uh, and then I got back to New York and I did a musical called Man of No Importance at Lincoln Center with the great Roger Reese, R.I.P., and all those amazing creators, Joe Montello, Terrence McNally, Aaron's and Flaherty. Um, and <clears throat> people started to take notice a little bit of me at that point. Um, I was, you know, had the classic thing of being dropped by an agent and a manager and picked up by another agent and a manager. A better one, I'm sure. Oh, much better at that point. Um uh, and then I was sort of off to the races. Then they had me running around town auditioning for really quality things. And I booked Rescue Me when I was 25, um, which shot here, actually, not in L.A. Oh. So I spent you know six months out of the year in my late 20s shooting a hit cable, well-written, New York shot television series. It was pretty dreamy at the time. So before we get into that, first of all, everyone should go <laughs> and download the Man of No Importance recording just to hear Streets of Dublin. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so was it hard though taking here you are a theater kid you you like got bit by the bug right before mm-hmm. your senior year and then you're off for television that is going to pretty much prevent you from being the theater actor that you set out to be yeah what was that like for you it was challenging uh i moved to new york with like dreams of being a broadway guy starring in broadway shows and um because of the cable schedule i could never commit to you know, at minimum, you got to commit nine to twelve months to be in a Broadway show, and I could never commit more than five or six. So I did do a play every. I've never, I've never gone a year without doing a play in New York, but there were always small plays or off Broadway plays or off off Broadway plays um, to get my theater fix through those seven years. But you know, missed out on some pretty spectacular <laughs> opportunities to say the least. Piazza being one Piazza, of them. yeah, South Pacific, Awaken Sing, my God, Assassins, really good things that uh, would have been an enormous amount of fun, but. Um, I can't complain. I, you know, I bought an apartment, so you know I know a lot of actors who uh, don't find themselves in that lucky scenario. Difference between acting on Broadway versus acting in front of a camera, I'll say for you. For me, totally different. Uh, similar skill, but a totally different skill. Um, you know, the camera doesn't lie, so it is all about just uh, believable behavior, and so so small. And in a theater, you've got to honor that, but also fill the space, uh, you know, physically and vocally, etc. Very different set of uh, muscles, in my experience. How do you prepare for an audition? I have a freakishly good memory, which is a weird thing about me. So I've never understood the uh, a lot of the actor stress about what do I do, hold the page, do I not hold the page, and blah, blah, blah. I generally just look at something and can memorize it very quickly. But that's one thing I do is I memorize it uh, because I want I don't want them to f- see me sort of fumbling with the page and looking at the words. And I know a lot of actors think you want to remind the people that you're not a finished product. But at the end of the day, they're comparing you to 10 or 20 or 50 other people. So I feel like the, as close as you can get to performance ready uh, is the best thing. Now, that being said, auditioning is the worst experience in the world. It's the worst thing about being an actor. 
especially in the TV film where would you have a page or two or or three lines of dialogue to book a job or not at least in the theater you have an opportunity to play a scene and sing a song etc but it's a it is a horrible part of the process and I'm so grateful to not do it anymore <laughs> <clears throat> Do you think it's harder for an actor to start today than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago? Or <clears throat> That's a really good question. You know, last year there were 437, I think, scripted television shows. So there's really quality TV out there. TV is the, is the medium now that's making the best on-camera work. Movies stink generally. And um, there's only like 20 actors that are allowed to be in movies. <laughs> so there's this huge landscape of television work out there. I think that's great compared to you know 20 years ago when there was just cbs abc nbc fox so there's more work on the tv side i think if you're if you have broadway fantasies i think it's probably a lot more frustrating because you know we've really become a a celebrity driven uh landscape here in new york and i think uh it's it's more rare when you um get to uh experience being in a Broadway show without having some television film clout already behind you. So I think that part is probably harder. So maybe a, a, a balance. All right. One of my James Lipton questions. Right? Oh, God. Right. If you could put one, only one, mm-hmm. of your performances in a time capsule for future generations <clears throat> to know you as an actor. Wow, that's a great what question. What would the one performance be? You know what? I... Uh, I did Carousel last spring at the Lyric Opera in Chicago with Laura Osnes and some amazing people. And uh, people have told me my whole career that I should play Billy Bigelow, and I finally did. I didn't know Carousel other than the songs. And it's the most extraordinary book and story and so ahead of its time and completely complicated. And I actually felt like it was written exactly for my skill set. I, I, I was in in the throes of playing the part, thinking to myself, "Boy, this, it's as if they tailor made this role uh, from from my skill set." Um, so for me, it would be that. I think. When you're deciding whether to take a role or not, what's mm-hmm. the most important? Part of it is it the piece itself? Is it the director? Mm-hmm. Is it the other actors? What do you look at when you make these decisions? Because you get thrown a lot of things yeah. these days, right? Yeah, I do. I do. It's a, uh, it's the it's the it's a really challenging but the most fun part of my current work life, which is choosing the right thing as opposed to just being so desperate that to ask that somebody would ask you to be in their thing, which is a very different set of challenges. For me, there's always a pie chart. It's about ec- the economics of it. Like, can I afford to do it? Economically, uh, is it a good job economically? Can I t- economically can I take care of my family, my mortgage, my kids in college, that kind of stuff? Uh, and then, of course, there's what is the project? Who wrote it? Who's directing it? Where is it taking place? You know, for me, if it's not in New York, I generally don't uh, look at it. Um, so those two things oftentimes don't sh- aren't shared. <laughs> um, so for me, it's always a balance between uh, you know trying to turn on the m- the income faucet a little bit if it's a television situation um, so that I can afford to do a piece of theater that I think is really quality in terms of writing, directing, where it's being done, etc. So you've done a lot of new shows in your career and you've <clears> got involved, like Sundance, mm-hmm. for example, Light of the Piazza very early on. Super early, yeah. Right? yeah. So do you like, as an actor, getting in really early? Yeah, I love it. Especially if you're around good people. I mean... Those that early company of Light in the Piazza was Adam Gettle and Vicky Clark and Celia Keen and Bulger and Kelly O'Hara and Mark Harlick and, and Bart Shear and Craig Lucas. I mean these are like the all these are like theater all stars. And we all became fast friends because we were drawn to Adam Gettle's music. And uh, so being around the people who are the best theater makers in the world is really exciting to me. That that's um, that would be the most the most important deciding factor for me in choosing something. And this is a, obviously a big topic these days, but mm-hmm. what do you think the role of the actor is in the development of a new piece at that stage? Like, how much do you, mm-hmm. as an actor, as, as Stephen, say, uh, I, you know, I just don't feel this is the right thing for me to say, this character right now, I feel yeah. it's this, can we talk <clears> about this? Like, is that appropriate? Is that definitely what actors should do? What do I you think? It's a, I think it's a, depends on the circumstance, but in my experience, uh, yeah, an actor is entirely essential in the development of a new work, and um, we we 
enter a room with a completely open spirit of collaboration because that's how we're built. Um, so yeah, if you're asking me, I think actors are essential in the, the developmental process, and I think the value that they contribute to the piece for, lasts for the life of the piece, not just the time that they're there, which is very different than an actor who comes in and, and plays a role that's already been built later on in the life of a show. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, it's a, I'm, that, I'm really passionate about that. The things that I work on, I see my work in the in the productions that happen with it elsewhere. I see I see it in my work. It's tangible. Um, like in additional productions, you yeah, see. or like the tours, or somebody comes in after. You know, what I mean, it's like uh, it's a really interesting conversation that we're all having in, in our community about about this. Um, but I think uh, you know, I, I would definitely count myself in the category of uh, artist who feels like his contribution in the developmental phase is essential in the life of that piece. So let's talk specifically about this, because obviously mm -hmm. the Hamilton issue that's come up over the last year about the sure. actors wanting <clears throat> to get a piece of the enormous amount of profit because they've been involved with the development sure, for, yeah. for such a long sure. period of time. What do you think is the appropriate way to do this? We've we've all obviously we've had a mechanism in place, a contract, a mm -hmm. workshop contract, which is so rarely used. Mm -hmm. So producers started using the lab contract with no mm -hmm. profit, but more yeah. weekly and health and all that stuff. I what, think, what do you think is the core of this issue and how do we fix it, Stephen? I think the current, well, let's fix it you and I right now, right? <laughs> Are you a producer and everybody. artist in this very room. Great. I think ultimately the solution, it will be uh, different language than what currently exists. I think the current template is a little unpalatable for our producer brothers and sisters. Uh, I think the current language states that if an actor is in development uh, in a quote-unquote workshop, they would receive 1% of the gross. Um, I believe that we should protect the producer's right to do anything they want with regard to future workshops, replace an actor, do a new thing, have a part go away, have a part grow without the current penalties, which I think are actually more of an issue than cutting in an actor on the, uh, on the percentage. I'm, I'm a person who advocates, and this is just me, I know my union is very split about this, uh, I would say the idea of, of windfall is when we need to be really um, aware of what of uh, of the issue. You know, once a show recoups and it's making money, that's when you that's when you pay the people who helped you build the show. I wouldn't uh, ask m um, my producer brothers and sisters to uh, pay a percentage of the gross weekly. But if something is windfall success, you know, Book of Mormon, Lion King, Hamilton, uh, Wicked, these shows make tons of money. Those actors were essential in building it. So uh, I'm an advocate of it. But I actually think, as you and I spoke, uh, what's more challenging for our producer friends is less that. If it was about net profit, a percentage of net profit, when there's tons coming in, that's less of an issue than it is the penalty in replacing an actor or having a part be rewritten or go away or whatever. I think currently you have to pay four weeks of a production contract salary, uh, weeks, insurance weeks. Uh, that to me is where we can, I think, get creative and, and make the penalty less severe because uh, the, with my producer hat on, I would, of course, want the ability to like workshop the hell out of something without being obligated to anyone. Um, but my union member in me would say, all right, but if I am helping you develop something for, let's say, six or eight weeks or more at that point, maybe that for me would be the threshold where I would get included in that 1% of net profits beyond recoupment. You know, which, let's be honest, doesn't happen that often. <laughs> yeah, it, it doesn't. And look, my producers, my producer peers will probably get upset at me for saying this, but I am a big believer in the fact that if, if we've recouped and the investors are making money, then why not kick a little back to the people that have their fingerprints actually on yeah. the piece itself? Yeah. If And I'm glad you brought it up. The... The issue for me has always been the first right of refusal. Exactly. For folks when they're when we're developing something that we just don't even know what it is yet. Yeah. And if we if we get rid of a director, which happens all the time, we mm -hmm. get half we cut a role to mm -hmm. be obligated to these folks going forward can add a huge amount of money to yeah. the capitalization, which reduces the chance of recouping in the first place. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how m my fellow union members feel about it but i agree with you i think first right of refusal and the penalty is a tough is a tough thing is a tough pill to swallow which is why we've gotten away from the workshop contract and into these lab and special agreement contracts i think <clears throat> yeah i think the solution is 
everyone would have a more buttoned up, vested, ball busting, ass kicking approach to work, to being in a workshop if you felt like you needed to do your best to be asked back and to be a part of it at the next phase, et cetera, uh, as opposed to feeling like uh, first right of refusal and the, and the penal, and the four week penalty, et cetera. I, I, the, the producer in me would feel like that's just costly um, and, and, and hinders the developmental process. What do you think about this idea? I blogged about this one. So say you're an actor and I go to you, like, look, because part of the lab was also created to give actors a little bit higher of a weekly salary than the workshop. Sure. Um, <clears throat> you gave up the percentage, but you got a higher livable, quote unquote, right, right. Week, right. weekly right. salary for those in New York weeks. City. Right. Um, what about if someone came to you and said, look, okay, I'll give you an option for mm. the higher salary, but you don't get profit, or you can take a lower salary and you get profit. That'd be great, right? You leave it up to the artist to choose. That'd be great, I think. Well, you'd get a lot of people who are like, you know, it's like it's like the TV film world. If you really believe in the project and you think there's going to be some profit, then choose that. And if you feel like, well, it's just about these four weeks because I don't know if I'm right for this part or if I'm going to do a good job in it, then I'll take the extra few hundred bucks a week. I think that'd be a really interesting experiment. And this is an issue you're you're involved with, right? Yeah, I'm passionate in it within my union, um, and we're all talking about it. Um, a lot, actually, uh, on 46th Street. Well, I think we just solved it. So, I, I, I mean, come on, net profit. Take the current language is not palatable. The new language is, uh, you know, post recruitment. Uh, upon the first profitable dollar, that's when everyone starts to participate. Done. We'll sign it right now. Great. Yeah. Uh, is there any myths about actors that you wish you could dispel? Yeah, most actors are crazy, but not all actors are crazy. <laughs> Yeah, that's definitely a myth that is 91% true, but, you know, 9 out of 100 are not crazy. If you could get every single producer in town in a room, yeah, and you could say one thing that you would want them all to know about actors to make us all work together a little better, what would it be? Oh, God, feed us. You know what I mean? Bagel Sunday would go such a long way and all really? this. Oh, my God, are you kidding me? Actors are like... Good, they're, we're like coyotes. There's, if there's food and somebody took care of it for us, we're the most grateful creatures on earth. It's the little things. It's the little things. It really is. How do you think Broadway is doing these days overall? You've, I have complicated seen- feelings about this. I think Hamilton. I think Great Comet. I think Spring Awakening last season. And I think some of the stuff that's happening is extraordinarily great and absolutely qualifies as the best theater in the world. But I do think that a lot of them come from the not-for-profit world and that's a little tricky when you're an actor because if what you have fantasies of is being a Broadway actor you've got to commit an enormous amount of time and effort to working like way below the poverty line and off Broadway and in hopes of making a nice Broadway salary and being a Broadway guy. I think we have to be careful um, going forward that we challenge our audiences and not reduce them or um, Broadway will not be the place where the greatest theater in the world happens and I think we, we're certainly there lately, um, but it's a it's a balance that we'll always have to make sure we're careful about. You and me. <laughs> we got to fix something else. Yeah. So you're obviously a theater guy that went out to Hollywood. You do both. Yeah. Now. I actually but, never went out to Hollywood. I've been a New York actor since oh, day one. Time. Never been there never except there. for I took one a, a one job this summer. I did the O.J. Simpson miniseries. And that's the most time I've ever spent in L.A. Quite acclaimed that many. I love. Oh you know, yeah, it's, people love it. People are are really uh, like passionate about it. So, but you started here and then pursued the TV film, and then you do both now, which is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you think about all those actors, those TV film actors that now come here and dabble in the? Old you know, I love stage? it if they're good, and I hate it when they stink. Who was bad? Tell us. Oh God, I'm not going to name names, yeah. but you know, like you think of great television actors like Bradley Whitford and Allison Janney, basically anyone on The West Wing. <laughs> They come and do plays, and they're amazing, and I want to buy tickets and watch them like everybody else. But, you know, occasionally we'll hire a super famous person who we know will say t- sell tickets and we know will not help the play be fully realized, and we don't care um, because, uh, the you know, the bottom line is the thing. And I think that's, you know, what I would like to see less of, but, you know, I, I, get, I get how the economy works. Was Tom Cruise in Vanilla Sky? Tom Cruise was in Vanilla Sky. So Tom Cruise comes to you and says, "I'm thinking about doing a Broadway show." What? What? what he might I be do? good. I think I he might. I think, think he'd be pretty good. good. Yeah, are you kidding? Might be good. But what would you yeah. say to him? What would your piece of advice? 
I'd say, well, it's, I'd be like, where can I invest? Would be my first. Touché. Don't forget, I at least slip on the producer hat. I, if Tom Cruise is a play and he's and he's talking to me about it, I want to invest a little bit of money. Would you ever produce? Yeah, totally. What would you produce? You know, I would I would get in bed with an artist that I feel passionate about. You know what I mean? Adam Gettle, Jason Robert Brown, Lin Manuel Miranda, Tom Kitt. Uh, I, I you know I'm passionate about artists. Okay, my last question. Yes. It's my genie question. Okay. I want you to imagine the genie from Aladdin comes yeah. to see you and thanks you for all the great work you've done on Broadway and being an advocate for the artist as well and says, Stephen, I want to thank you by granting you one wish. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I haven't even gotten to the oh question Oh, my God, yet. I know. I wish for three more wishes. <laughs> no more. Oh, all right. Bullshit. Tim Rice tried that. <laughs> um, so, the, his... <laughs> his statement is this what is the one thing that drives you so crazy about broadway that makes you angry that makes you pound your fist on the table that keeps you up at night that you would ask this genie to wish away with a snap of his fingers Oof. one thing i would like <clears throat> the magic genie to uh always make sure that the commercial aspect and the artistic aspect are a striving for the same thing. <laughs> An impossible task, but maybe. What's the best way we can do that? We can be... Uh, like from your perspective, when you're... An, you've been in a lot of shows. Some yeah. have worked. Some yeah, been, have yeah. not. Unfortunately, Bridges, Bridges of Madison County, which is one of mine, which unfortunately had a much abbreviated run that it should yeah. have. From your perspective, when you're standing on that stage... yeah. Can you ever see like this isn't going right? No, I think things you know like Bridges was uh, di didn't succeed economically, but was wildly successful artistically. So I guess the challenge is how do we how do we make sure that the things that people think are good succeed? And if we're only relying on the tourist dollar, and I think we're at like what seventy percent of ticket our ticket buyers are tourists right now, I think uh, it provides a real challenge. I think we have to appeal to uh, our city. And people who love good theater maybe more than we than we are a little bit currently. What do you think of that? I like it. I do too. Thank you so much for spending. Thank time you, with Ken us Davenport. Today. Thank you for continuing to do Broadway. You're going to keep doing stuff here. Right? Yeah, I'm looking for something in the spring. What do you got? All right, I'm gonna. We're going to go off the record now. So I got to <laughs> say goodbye to all of you. Thanks so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Don't forget to check out the Producers Perspective Pro.com and sign up for a free 30 day trial and come to the networking event tomorrow. Get all the information at the Producers Perspective Pro.com.